joins me right now, Don Fullov, also known as Goldie Wilson from Back to the Future. Don, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm so excited to talk to you. Hey, glad to be here. Uh, you know, it's been a long time coming. I'm so I'm so excited to finally get you on the line. I mean, Mayor Goldie Wilson is without a doubt one of the most iconic characters. I think, in cinematic history. Um, and it's so cool to finally get to talk to you. How are things, though, going for you right now during this kind of crazy time that we're living in the world? Oh, well, just out here uh, in good old Hill Valley social distancing. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as the mayor, you got to touch the people, right? You got to, you got to, you got to um, make sure everybody is calm, cool, and collected. And I see that you're doing a good job. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> well, let's, let's start from the top, though. You know, um, you're one of the, Goldie Wilson is one of those iconic characters, like I said. But let's start with you. Where did your career begin in acting, and and, and where were you, you know, born and raised, and where did when did you get the bug? Many, many moons ago, uh, my mother was a contestant on a show called The Hollywood Square. Wow! And as a little tyke, I went with her to film the show, and quite naturally, they took her off to the uh, soundproof room, and they were doing pre-production for the show, so you know. People that were there in the audience with contestant members, uh, one of the producers of the show asked me if I wanted to sit up in the square while they rigged the lights and sound. So they put me in Michael Landon's square, and uh, being a precocious kid, I was. For whatever reason, they liked me and asked me a bunch of questions, and the next thing you know, I had an agent. Thus began the career of Don Fulola. So here you are. You just you're going somewhere with your mom, and next thing you know, you you have a whole career ahead of you. Um, so were you you're a child actress? So what what were some of the first things that you uh, worked on? Well, I started off in voiceover. So the very first thing that I ever did was playing the voice of Michael Jackson on the Jackson Five cartoon show, and then I went on to do a bunch of other uh, cartoon series, a uh, show called. Um, Emergency Plus Four, which is based off of the uh, TV show on at the time called Emergency. Uh, I did a show called Kid Power, which was based on a comic strip called We Pals. And just a bunch of other uh, you know, radio spots and stuff like that. How was it playing Michael Jackson, the voice of Michael Jackson? And this is in a time where Michael's still the biggest thing in the world. Um, how was that getting to play Michael? I was the coolest kid in the seventh grade. <laughs> I'm sure you were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that but that must have been yeah, a trip for you. Was, were you a big Michael fan? I was. Everybody in the world was a Jackson 5 fan. I definitely was. So to be able to hang out with them, Diana Ross, all the greats from Motown back in the day, Temptations, Marvin Gaye, Barry Gordy, kind of, uh, kind of fun for a kid. I, I would imagine I think it blew that would so, away too. Yeah, I, I would imagine that would be kind of a, a of a crazy experience. And were, I guess being exposed to it so young, did it did it feel like oh this happens for every kid, or did you know that this was a unique journey that you were on? Oh no, it obviously it was obvious that it was pretty unique. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, now uh, I, I know according according to you know online like me, you're a Texas boy, um, uh, born in Dallas. Is that correct? Uh, I was birthed in Dallas. I never stayed there. I immediately came, was immediately sent back to Los Angeles where my, my parents live. Oh, okay. So you're, you're pretty much a, a, a born and bred West coaster. Oh yeah. My, uh, my mother just happened to be visiting Texas when, uh, when I, uh, when she went into labor. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So you're, you're out there in California, you're playing Michael Jackson. You're the coolest kid in the seventh grade. Like you said, and you're saying you do a lot of cartoons, voiceover work. When was it that you had your first like on camera, on screen role in a television or, or a film? Uh, it was a CBS movie of the week in 1980. It was called Scared Straight: Another Story. It was based off the documentary uh, Scared Straight about kids being taken to prison so that the convicts could uh, try and scare them into a life of being straight, as opposed to a life of crime. So uh, that was the first uh, major role that I had. I played a character named Smash, who unfortunately was not scared straight. <laughs> didn't work out for him, huh? Did, didn't work out for the young guy. But the thing about it is the movie was so, uh, the people that cast me in the movie were so impressed with the work that I had done. It was, uh, they were the ones who cast Back to the Future. 
And uh, they brought me in to meet with uh, Zemeckis, uh, Zemeckis, Spielberg, and, and Gale. Wow! So that's how I got to. That's how I got to. That was the jump to uh, Back to the Future. So you go into this casting session with with Zemeckis, Gale, you know Steven Spielberg, who at the time is a is a kingmaker in Hollywood in most people's eyes. Um, what what was your preparation? Did so you obviously they sent you some sides or something? You knew that you're going to audition for for this character, Goldie Wilson. What was your first impression of the character? Let me ask you that. When you read the script, you saw what you were supposed to go in there and do. What was your first impression of Goldie Wilson? Well, I don't know about most of the people from the cast. I think it was you know quite a few of the people from the cast. There was never a script. There was there was only meetings. Um, I there was no script. There was no sides. I just went in for a meeting with them, and they were asking me questions that. Uh, <laughs> Until I actually did the film, I didn't understand what they were asking me questions about. They were asked, they asked me if I knew how to sing, obviously, uh, because they were probably considering the role of Marvin Berry for me as well. And I guess after the meeting, they decided, you know what, you're a better fit as a, as a Goldie Wilson. So I never heard from them for, I guess, I don't know, a couple of weeks. And then I got a call and uh, your part was offered to me. Wow, that's so you you didn't know exactly what you're going in for. You just went in for an informal meeting. And, and what was your first impression of, of Robert Zemeckis and Gail and, and Steven Spielberg? How, how, describe that meeting from what you can remember. Back then, video games were just becoming the rage, the arcade style video games. And I remember going into Universal Studios, and at that time, probably still now, I'm sure, Amblin Entertainment had a compound on the Universal Studio lot. So you're on the Universal Studio lot, and you drive, and then you drive up to Amblin, and it's a whole nother giant gate. And uh, as the gate to Amblin open, and you begin to see the uh, Amblin compound, you kind of get overwhelmed because you're like, holy cow, this is where Steven Spielberg does all of his stuff, so Steven Spielberg. So I get inside, and I remember prior to going in the office meeting with him, it was a room just full of arcade video games to play <laughs> so it's crazy that was the, that was young don's first impression of uh the first meeting of back to the future so how long between that meeting did, did it take for you to get the role about how long do you remember the process being i, I think it was one or two weeks it wasn't a long time and then you um, you get cast, and then when you find out that Goldie Wilson, you're, you're not going to play Marvin Barry, that's going to Harry Waters Jr., you're going to be playing Goldie Wilson, they think that you're the perfect fit. Then when you finally see a script and you're, you're getting to understand your character, you're the mayor of Hill Valley in, in the 80s, in the 50s, you're working at Lou's Cafe, what was your impression of, of Goldie Wilson then? Uh, I don't know that I had an impression of Goldie as much as I just did of, of trying to bring the, the, the character to life because of the fact that uh, his main scenes were in the 50s and the 50s being a highly prejudicial time during our history. Um, the, the thought of, of, of a black person becoming mayor of any city uh, was absurd. The thought of, of a busboy becoming the mayor is absolutely crazy. But the fact that Goldie had the type of uh, internal fortitude and, and uh, confidence in himself to instill that confidence into uh, George McFly was a big deal. I didn't realize how big a deal that was because I was just an actor doing a part. And, you know, as history has shown that, you know, that's, I did a lot, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then so you, you're, you're, you're getting ready to, to film, and, and the cast is set, and as many people know, Eric Stoltz was the original Marty McFly. Did you work with Eric Stoltz in those six weeks of production? I worked for four of those weeks with Eric. Wow. And did you did, was there a feeling on set that it wasn't working, or did everyone think that everything was going fine, and, it, and this seemed like, okay, we're going forward with this movie, Eric's doing great? I mean, I would hear little whispers and stuff. I mean, you know, I was, I was a day player. Nobody was going to tell me behind the scenes stuff. But just being there and, and just hearing little snips of conversation made me think that, uh, you know, something was in the air. So were you already done um, with all of your scenes for the for the film um, when Michael came in? 
Yeah, I was already done. So uh, how, this was near. I think this was near Christmas of '84, I believe, when uh, Bob Gale's office gave me a call and asked me if I'd like to come back and do it all over again. And that's what I wanted to ask. How hard is that? Because I would think as an actor, you kind of figure out what you want to do. You go in there the day of shooting. Shooting days, as everyone knows, are long. They can go forever. But you have these pivotal scenes in the 1950s. You're really um, our first real link between what we see in 85 and 55. And we see, we're going to see Goldie Wilson become mayor. And you, you put, up, put in your performance, and then you get a call that you got to come back and redo everything. How hard is that as an actor? Uh, it wasn't hard at all. <laughs> you're an actor, you know, you're, you're paid to act. And, you know, back then I was a young guy and acting is all I wanted to do. I didn't care if it was acting on a, on a street corner, as long as I was acting, it didn't matter. And then the opportunity to get it, uh, to do it all over again. And originally I knew that Michael J. Fox was supposed to have been in the lead. Everyone knew that Michael right. J. Fox was supposed to have been in the lead, but, uh, Gary, Gary, what was his name? Gary David Goldberg, I think, mm -hmm. uh, who was the producer of Family Ties. Um, wouldn't let him go. So the rest, as they say, is history. That's right. And um, and Michael comes in, and did it feel? I guess the second go around, did you feel maybe so you said you're an actor? So now that um, you're, you're paid to act, you're coming in the second time. I guess that maybe in in some ways it was even a little bit easier because you knew everybody, you knew uh, you know what you needed to accomplish by the end of the day. So I, I guess was it easier the second time around, or the same, or was there any difference at all? With all due respect, Brad, mm -hmm. I don't even remember the first time around. <laughs> really? Wow. Okay. I, I, I remember nothing about shooting the first time around except that uh, they have craft services. And craft services, they had the most, the largest shrimp I had ever seen in my life. <laughs> That's what I remember. <laughs> But there you go. I mean, I remember that too. Uh, that was something that stick out to me. Um, and then in that scene, though, it lose cafe, and and I've heard you talk about it before. Um, but it's one of those things that I think that anybody who's seen the film, one of the one of the lines that everyone remembers is is the is the inflection, the vocal inflection of delivery of of mayor, the way that you say it. Um, did was that just a natural thing, or did you have any? Did you put any thought into that, or did that just how it came out? I was more. I, I was thinking more about the physical aspect, about the um, ab ab about the revelation coming over my face, more so than I was the the audio portion. The audio portion was just <laughs> it was just organic. It just happened like that. Did you do you think it had anything to do with your your background as, as a vocal actor? You know, you're you're trying to bring these characters to life without using facial features, just using vocal inflection, and maybe that was maybe that training. Is, is what made that line, because it's iconic. It's weird that one word, just the way that it said mayor, you wouldn't think that that would stick out so much in the film, but every person who's seen the movie knows mayor. You know, I can't do it justice, but everybody knows that. Do you think that your background in voice acting had anything to do with it? I have to plead the fifth. I have no idea. It just, it just happened, and just like the whole movie, everything just works. <laughs> I think that, that I think that's a great way to put it because it it seemed like everything in this movie just seemed to click. And when you um, I don't know if it was at a premiere, or you had a a cast and crew screening. I don't know the first time you saw the film after it was completed before it was released in in July of eighty five. But when you saw it, is it one of those things to where you knew, hey man, this actually might be huge? Well, the fact that it was a Steven Spielberg film and it was starring probably one of the most uh, famous television personalities at the time. I, I assumed it would be, you know, a decent film. And I um, go ahead. I, I was uh, I thought my part was too little. <laughs> <laughs> I, For sure, you know. And I, and, and and Harry got a gold record, so I tease him about that all the time. I could have been I could have been Marvin Berry and had a gold record. <laughs> <laughs> but but instead, you're you're a forever nobility as the mayor of 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 Hill Valley. But it goes to number one. It's the biggest movie of the year. Um, were you thinking? Well, obviously they're going to do another one. Uh, I was not actually. So when when you got the call to come in and okay go ahead I'm sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say that uh, 
after the theatrical release and it, you know, did what it was supposed to do. I mean, I was an actor. I was out trying to find other work um, because that was in the can and there wasn't going to be anything else coming from that. So, you know, I went on with my life. And then when you, when you get the call that they're, they're all going to do the sequel, I mean, it's several years later, four years later um, is, is when in 89 is when back to the future two came out. So were you, um, were you, ex- when you heard the sequel was going, were you expecting a phone call? Did you think maybe they can find a way to get Goldie Wilson back in this one? Um, and then when you got the call that you're also going to play uh, your I guess grandson, Goldie Wilson, the third, what was your, what was your thinking then? Well, now that's a cute story. I didn't know that Back to the Future 2 was being shot until it was finished. And when it was finished, I was a little upset because they didn't uh, have any uh, any Goldie Wilson in part two. But hey, it's universal. I'm just a little actor. Go pound sand, dude. Um, and then I got a call. don't remember who it was from. I got a call from the studio that... Uh, wanted to negotiate a deal with me to uh, come and play Goldie Wilson the third. And I declined it um, because they wanted to give me a little bit of money. And I knew at this time that this film had made a bazillion dollars. So money wasn't an issue. So I just said, no, I don't want to do it. And uh, unless you give me this day rate and they declined the day rate, obviously. Went on about my business, and I guess a day or two later, I got a call. They're like, okay, we'll give you the day rate. And I go, and uh, was it stage 27? I can't remember. One of the stages at Universal, I go in there, and they have this huge green screen set up. So I go in there to green screen. They dress me up. I, I do the whole hover conversion thing, and um, that's how it all happened. But because the film was over and all the credits had been done, if you notice, I don't know about now, but you'll notice on the original that my name does not appear in any of the credits of Goldie Wilson III because they had already been done, and to go and redo them obviously would have been a big uh, budgetary issue. So there's a little trivia for you. Wow, I did not know that because uh, you, you just assume that it was all done at the same time, and I didn't know that the film had already been completed. That's something I didn't even know. Um, and and for you, though, to, to be able to still be a part of, even even you know just doing the the Goldie Wilson the third thing, um, I'm sure it was fun to continue the le- the legacy of that character. And um, and you said you're you're doing more acting in between. Then, how how much do you think that that character, or, or let me not how much? Why do you think the character of Goldie Wilson resonates so well? Because uh, in the book that I worked on, I list Goldie Wilson as uh, one of the, if not the most important character outside of, you know, the main four of, of Doc, you know, Marty, Lorraine, and, and Biff, and George. Um, why do you think Goldie Wilson made that connection with so many people and why we think about Goldie Wilson every time we think about Back to the Future? Well, my best guess is uh, after having in 2010 I found out I found out in 2010 that Back to the Future was a, still a big hit. I didn't know. Um, really? You had no idea that people that, still like connected to it so much? Didn't have a clue. Wow, really? Did not have a clue. Okay. I saw I saw a Back to the Future Back to the Future reunion on the internet uh, out here in Burbank. And uh, it was Chris, it was Michael, Claudia Wells, Jeffrey Wiseman, Bob Gale. Uh, and some other people. I saw the picture, and then once again, I got pissed off again because I basically thought, here it is, Back to the Future, dissing me again. <laughs> um, and, and so I decided to do some Googling and, and looking and stuff, and as I began to you know, go through, I Googled my name, and I Googled the character's name, and then I came back with pages and pages and pages of stuff. And I had a friend who had been telling me for years, man, the mirror, the mirror, the mirror yeah, whatever. Um, and then I saw all of that stuff and, and I was like, holy cow. But to answer your question, I think uh, because of the fact that now I've been to so many uh, the, the personal appearances and comic cons and I've had a chance to talk to the fans and stuff like that. I, I imagine it's just because of the fact that the character instilled such, along with their mayor part, instilled uh, a, a, a level in conf- a level of confidence in people who might have been wavering on the, 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 the less confident side. 
Um, I've had a lot of conversations about this. People tell me, you know, that really inspired me and stuff. I was like, wow, okay, that's awesome. That's the, that's the best I can do for you, Brad. I, I don't understand the phenomena. No, I, I think that I, I think that you do. I think you hit it right on the head. It is such a to me, it is an inspiring thing because I always think about uh, Don. Like I don't know. Sometimes I break it down. Like man, if I never if I never talked to that person, I would have never met this person. I never would have done that. You know, I kind of break it down. And when you think about Goldie Wilson, you know, had Marty just not given him that one small you know line, that's right, he's going to be mayor, and and given the character of Goldie something to shoot for. Even if it was 30 years from now, he had that in the back of his mind the whole time. That, uh, and, and it goes with the film. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. I think that Goldie Wilson is the perfect example of that. And it was before uh, Marty had, before Marty's changes, George's changes, even Doc's. It was Goldie Wilson that we first knew, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. And I think that's why the character has resonated for all of these years. Now going on the 35th anniversary, if you can believe it or not, of the first film, wow, um, crazy! Uh, in in 2015, when we had the Future Day celebrations, I know that you've done so many great things with the Back to the Future community. What was that like for you, actually, being able to live in Future Day and see that fandom all come rushing back again? We were in uh, we were in London, and uh, it was surreal. It was just surreal. That's all I can say. Um, there were so many people there and so many people have such love for the trilogy. I, 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 I continue to be humbled and astounded by the, the staying power of this film. Do you think, um, and it's a, it's a, it's a debate with, with, with the fan community so much, but do you think that we ever see a continuation of the, of the series or would you like to see another Back to the Future, whether it be a four or a reboot or anything like that? Or do you think that these three films, they hit it out of the park, there's no reason to touch it, let it be? I think people want another one simply because the first three was so endearing, but I don't think that another one will capture the essence of what the, the original did. It's, you know, leave it alone. Let it, let it, let it, uh, let it live in its glory. Don't try and do anything and it's my understanding that the Bobs have uh, something written into their contracts or whatever that as long as they're alive or whatever that no remakes can be made and and I think that you know it's it's one of those things it's it's I think as a fan I would I would be open to another story but I'm, I'm like you I don't think that you could just capture the, the the magic of those first three especially the first one which many people regard as as a perfect movie now um after the Future Day thing was was awesome for everybody. In 2018, you did uh, a project called the Fastest DeLorean, World's Fastest DeLorean. Talk talk to me about fastest DeLorean in the world. Talk to me about that. What was the um, what was the inspiration to do the fastest DeLorean in the world? And well, uh, Claudia Wells invited me over to a, a, a fan event. Um, oh gosh, I forget what year it was. A while back. And uh, the event um, was, was taking place at a, at a house not too far from where I live. And I get there, and the guy that owns the house has a, a DeLorean time machine and a, uh, a mini golf course in his backyard, um, Adam Contra. So after meeting Adam, I mean, you know, we just kind of hit it off. We just became buds. And Adam has a distinct uh, pleasure of being the longest running vlogger. In history, he's been doing a video blog since way before digital stuff was happening. Um, so we became friends, and uh, we would just shoot different stuff. And uh, the, the the transmission or the transmission of the engine in his car blew up or just went out. DeLoreans aren't noted for their awesome drivetrains, by the way. Um, so he decided to put a uh, big engine in it. Or that engine, I think it was a L three, LS three, or something like that, and then document it as uh, as it as it happened. So when he put it in there, he decided to go for the world's record. And like I said, Adam documents everything. So every time we went somewhere and did something with our new car, he would shoot it and he knitted it all together and came up with a with a film. That's how that happened. Yeah, and, and and it's available. People can watch it now. And and now that we're here at the 35th anniversary, Don, um, what what? And I know it's a weird time in the world right now, but um, 
what can we expect from Goldie Wilson? It is an election year. I know that Goldie has been putting his name out there, maybe going to be on the ballot in November. What can we expect from Goldie Wilson in, in the year 2020? Well, it came to my understanding that in 2016, uh, I had a shot at being president because I think I had a total of about 17 or 18 write-in votes. <laughs> So it's a start, so right? So Goldie, Goldie, huh? It was a, it's a good start. But that's a great start, you know. That's that's eighteen, eighteen only, only what, eighty million to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, every every election Goldie runs, Goldie probably will never win, but it's just to bring some levity and, and fun into what sometimes can be a tense and weird situation. Oh, I think it's fun. Well, De- Goldie's always going to have my vote, and and um, like I said, it's crazy that we're here at the thirty fifth anniversary. And and Don, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me because there's so many people out there like me who are fans of these films, who who hold them near and dear to their hearts. Um, and you have been one of those characters that has been in my life as long as. Here's the thing: you've been in my life as long as my parents have, as far as I'm concerned, or or any or my oldest friend. I've I've seen Goldie Wilson my entire life. And it's an absolute honor and privilege to be able to speak to you today, especially now that we're embarking on the 35th anniversary of the films. Um, I ask everybody who's come on to the show, this um, uh, Crispin, Jeffrey, Leah, Harry, er everybody I've asked them. And I'll ask you to, to close out here in your opinion, what makes back to the future timeless? Um, Story performance, and visual. Wow. I think that that is a phenomenal answer. <laughs> Goldie Wilson, Don Full of Love, I appreciate you taking the time. Let the people know where they can find you, get in contact with you, follow you, get any merchandise that you may have, and where can they vote in November for Goldie Wilson? There's always a little blank space at the end of every ballot that says right in. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's fun and games. I want everybody to take their vote seriously, though. And, and, and vote for who they really believe can take this country forward. Um, my vote for Goldie is just a novelty thing, and it's fun, like I said. This brings levity to the situation. But it's very serious to vote, so I just tell everybody, get out there and uh, do your thing to vote. Awesome, and I know you have, you have the website. You can find Don online there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's um, uh, MayorGoldieBPTF.com. MayorGoldieBTTF.com. You got all gro- kinds of great stuff. You can get campaign pins, uh, a sign, 8 by 10s I know you got the gambit over there, so make sure you go do that for Don. Don, again, I appreciate you taking the time. Mr. Mayor Goldie Wilson, Don Full of Love, thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry it took so long.